In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're still in these Advent days of waiting. I know, I know. It's getting close. We're almost ready for that, that phrase, you know, the, the one that starts with the M and the C. But we're not quite there yet. We're still waiting. And as we wait, we continue to pray. But as we pray, Isaiah gives us a prayer. He provides a prayer for God's people as they are in waiting in the middle of the terrible things that are happening among his people. Enemy armies are raging around them, and they certainly have sorrows and iniquities in this world. And we, too, have all kinds of things swirling around us in our days of waiting for our Lord's return. The people of Israel, along with Isaiah, ask for God's help. And we do too. But sometimes when you ask for help, it seems like you might get more than you bargain for. The author, Chris Davis, tells a series of stories. First, he talks about a bank teller in Dayton, Ohio, who calls 911 for medical intervention when a man there in the bank lobby, uh, Robert Strank, nearly passes out. And he asks the teller to call for help. Meanwhile, Police in Des Moines, Iowa, responded to a panicked request from uh, William Klein after his 10-year-old son, Brian, handcuffed the two of them together, not realizing that when his dad kept his handcuffs from his part-time security job, he didn't keep the handcuff key. And in Pretoria, South Africa, passers-by and police came to the aid of a man who found himself locked inside a car for an hour and a half, banging on the windows and shouting for help. In each of these accounts, you would assume that when the helpers showed up, this was a good thing, and it was all going to work out okay in the end, right? Well, in each case, there's more to the story. The arrival of the paramedics to that Huntington Bank branch would have been really excellent news had not Mr. Strank communicated with the teller a second time after asking for help, this time passing the teller a note asking for all the money. Whether or not the fainting spell was part of the attempted bank robbery, Strank didn't realize that a 911 call would send both paramedics and police officers. And so when they cleared him of any medical uh, danger, the police took him into custody. Meanwhile, the officers who responded to the handcuffing there in Des Moines had a good laugh because it was on this day, Father's Day of all days, that the son had handcuffed himself to his father. And as they were leaving, the police, according to their policy, ran William's name through their police database. The search revealed that the father had not one, but two outstanding warrants. So he found himself once again in handcuffs, this time for real. And what of the poor man stuck in the car in South Africa? As it turns out, he was a thief, posing as a car guard using an electronic jammer to open the doors of the cars, which worked out really well until he found himself inside this BMW that, as a security feature, had automatic locks that couldn't be undone from the inside. The vehicle owner was kind enough to let him out when she found his predicament, and that's when the police, once again, took him into custody. All these people asked for help, and they got more than they bargained for. What first looks like it should have been good news, not the good news that they hoped for. This prayer in Isaiah, at first, seems like God's people. Even you and I receive more than we ask for. And to be honest, there's parts of this prayer that don't seem like very good news at all. It reminds us of the first commandment when we hear that we shall have no other gods before the Lord. And even as we confess that this means that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And we want to recoil at being afraid of God. But this prayer from Isaiah, it resonates with what's to come. This prayer that Isaiah prays 
starts with a request. God, show up, rend the heavens, rip them open like a garment, and come down here. Come to where your people are because there are things in this world that are not okay. Your presence is needed and we need your help. So Isaiah teaches us to pray that God bring his help and his presence right here to where we are. And it's accompanied then with images of God's presence from the Old Testament. As Isaiah goes on to mention that God's, uh, that God's presence comes down, burning up the brushwood and taking the water and rolling it to a boil. God's presence, after all, is shown as fire throughout Scripture when God appears to Moses in the burning bush. When God appears in the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And now the fire of God's presence comes to burn up the enemy brushwood, to roll the fire, to roll the water into a boil. As God opens the heavens and comes to his people, the Lord had come and revealed his presence before. He shook the mountains before too. He did that in the days of Moses there at Mount Sinai when the people of God were given the law and they saw the mountain shake and they said, we don't want to do anything with that. The mountains shook again in the days of Elijah when the presence of God appeared to him, even though the presence of God was not in the earthquake, but in that still small voice. The Lord. He only is God, and he is the one who shows up to help his people, especially in the days of enemies and adversaries and people who are out to get them. So good indeed. Until the people, led by Isaiah, confess that they had sinned against God and against his ways. And God was angry. How could they be saved? The other shoe? drops. The sinful people of God, who had tolerated idolatry in their midst, who even had their kings leading them in idolatry, well, they had no other option but to admit their sin and their sinfulness. They were unclean, but not just dirty. God's law has a focus on the cleanliness of his people that makes them unique that applied to their food, to their clothing, to their haircuts, to their funeral practices, and so many other things that they did, because God called them not to be like the nations around them, but they wanted to be like the nations around them, and so they stopped being unique. They stopped following the Lord's commands, and they started blending in with the world around them. Truly, they were unclean, and even their righteous acts were filthy. The wind of their sins swirled around them, blowing them away like fall leaves. The Lord their God is the potter, and they are the clay. He had every right to be angry with them because of their sin. And you and I, we're no better than them. Who are we to call out to God for rescue? Why would we ask God to come here to help us where we are. If he comes, he will see our sin. Not only will his judgment come against our sinful enemies, but we too should be judged for our sin. The full weight of God's law should be placed upon our sinfulness. Even among good church-going people, even among the hardy and brave who make it to the Wednesday evening Advent services, there are no excuses. We have flirted with idolatry, maybe not to the false gods of Baal and Asherah, but to the gods of wealth and convenience and selfishness and some other ones. We have certainly bent our knees from time to time. The things that you and I would like to think of as righteous deeds are contaminated by our sinfulness. If we call on God to visit us and to rescue us, sinners like us deserve his condemnation and his anger. Advent, even in its fleeting days, 
is a time when God calls his people, when God calls you to repent. Indeed, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags, and you shrivel up, and the wind of sin should blow you away. So what should you do in these last days of Advent because of your sin and your sinfulness? What's the next step? Like Isaiah teaches the people, cry out to God. Pray this Advent that your Lord come to you, visiting you not with his anger, but with his love. You are able to expect him to visit you in love because he's done it before. In the days of old, God visited his people starting in a manger in the little city of Bethlehem. He kept visiting them, rescuing them, and setting creation right as he did miracles, undoing the terrible things in the world like leprosy and lameness and muteness and blindness. He taught them as one who has authority. And then, in his great love for his people, he died on the cross and rose again, showing that he is the first of those raised from the dead. He is the one who has come to forgive us our trespasses through his death and his resurrection. Isaiah asked, how then shall we be saved? The love of Jesus. And even in Jesus' love, even as he ascended up into heaven, the angels who came among the disciples said that he would come again. And indeed, he will come again with the cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. That will not be a sound of judgment. When God opens up the heavens and comes down with that sound, it's not a sound that you need to be afraid of at all. No, instead, it's the sound of rescue. Here comes the cavalry. Jesus, your Lord, will come and show you his nail-marked hands and his spear-pierced side and say, for your sins, I died. And for your forgiveness, I was wounded. You are the potter and he is the clay. And he has come forming you and shaping you out of your sinfulness into his righteousness by his love. As you live in the middle of this world where it seems that no one cries out to God and so many people and institutions are God's enemies, boldly cry out, come Lord Jesus, the Lord who came to his people in a manger and on a cross, will hear your prayer and open up the heaven and come down to rescue and save you. And that is exactly the answer to the prayer that you need. Thanks be to God that he hears your prayer and that he answers it in love. Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.